Hello everyone. Um, so today I'm going to tell you the story of an open source network protocol and how we brought SRT from a proprietary software to an open source success. So who am I? Uh, my name is Olivier Kajet. I'm the uh, multimedia domain lead at Collabra, where I've worked since uh, 2007. But I've also been an open source developer since uh, 1999, first working on a GNOME and uh, since I've been a uh, active developer of the distributor community. I'm one of the core maintainers, and uh, this is something I've been doing uh, for over a decade now. Um, what are we gonna talk today is something called SRT. So SRT stands for Secure Reliable Transport, and it's a generic protocol to send streams reliably over the internet. Uh, it was designed to transport MPEG transport streams uh, for with low latency, but good quality, uh, with encryption for security, and it's really been designed for uh, use by broadcasters. Uh, so SRT is a protocol, but it's also a library implementing it. And I would say it's first and foremost a library, right? It was created as software before actually being defined as a protocol in, 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 in English. Uh, this library is uh, now open source, and this is what we, we help bring to the community. It's multi-platform, Linux, Windows, Mac OS, Android, iOS, tvOS, I mean, all of the major platforms are supported. So where do we start, right? SRT uh, originally was developed by a company called High Vision. Uh, they developed it as a proprietary protocol. It was a differentiating feature of their uh, products compared to the competition. And they had deployed it almost across their entire product line. So if you used a couple years ago, if you use High Vision products, uh, you could send SRT from one High Vision to, to another, but nothing else obviously because it was proprietary to their company. Um, so who are the players here, right? The first player is High Vision. Uh, so High Vision created SRT, and they're a good company. They have a very solid engineering team, uh, but like most uh, software companies, they're they're not really into open source, right? They they use a lot of open source. They have a lot of their products, which are actually running Linux inside, and have a lot of open source software inside of them. But everything that they did themselves, they had the very traditional mindset that it has to bring like value. And you know, if they open source it, they're not going to get any value, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they didn't really know how to do open source. Uh, on the other hand, there's us. We're Collabra. We're an open source consultancy. Uh, everyone at Collabra is an open source developer. We all have open source expertise, and we've been doing multimedia almost since the beginning of the company. So we helped High Vision make uh, SRT into an open source project and open source successful project. And I'm going to tell you this story, right? How we and iVision together made the SRT into a really successful open source project. So before we start the project, we have to go through a couple steps, right? So the first step is asking ourselves, why are we doing this? Uh, for us as open source people, we think like this is the most self-evident thing in the world. If you do something, it's going to be open source. But for many companies, they need a, a justification. It, it, it's not the default yet. And for High Vision, the main uh, reason they wanted to make SRT open source at first was to have adoption. Uh, they wanted video over the internet to work and to work reliably and to work interoperably amongst all the devices that you can buy from different vendors. To not have to have like, so that their customers and all the users don't have to have like devices from one vendor that they can mix and match, but that they would have interoperability and have good quality of transmission. They also wanted to raise their profile. So they wanted to raise the, the strength of the high vision brand. And they thought that by developing a protocol and a system that everyone would use, that would make their brand much more known. And they wanted to make the ecosystem more open, right? So increase interoperability there. Uh, one of the things that we also have to ask yourself when you develop a, uh, a new open source project and what are non-goals, right? What's not an actual goal here? Uh, that's almost as important as knowing what your goals are. And in this case, one thing that was not a goal was to increase contributions. They felt that they had the development in hand quite solidly. So they were not trying to get like more developers for the product. They were really trying to get people to actually use it. Uh, then we looked, what else is there? What's the competition? Uh, is there any open source alternative? And we looked and we couldn't find anything else that was really at the feature set that the uh, broadcast industry needed. 
There are things like WebRTC that are developed for low latency, but didn't have the kind of quality and the simplicity that, that they need for, for broadcast users. Uh, but there were a number of proprietary solutions down there. Uh, among them, Zixi and Aspera, which come as SDKs, but their actual product is a service. So the SDK is free, like money free, but not open source. But to actually use it, you need to pay these companies for the service to tra transfer the streams. Uh, and then there were a bunch of vendor specialized uh, protocols like High Vision and SRT, but a number of their competitors had similar features and functionalities with uh, different homemade protocols that were all incompatible with each other. So there was really nothing out there that was like a direct competition. So as I said, almost everyone in the market had a similar solution. And in a way, SRT and all of the others kind of work the same. The underlying principles are the same, the street transmissions, maybe for the were correction. There's like no great magic there. Uh, so SRT's big differentiator that we saw was that it would be open source. That means it's easier to integrate it. Uh, you don't have to ask for permission. And, but also you can use it for a thing that it was not originally designed for. Right? Since it's open source, it will be open source. Uh, you can actually like, do whatever you want with it, use it for things that the original developers did not think of, which is often much more difficult with proprietary software. So uh, SRT is a network protocol. And when people think network protocols and open, they think open standards, right? Uh, so we ask ourselves, maybe there's no software, but maybe there exists a standard out there that's open that, that we could just use instead of you know, uh, having to create a different new software. And uh, for video transmission, a lot of the low latency protocols out there are based on RTP. Uh, it's possible to do everything that SRT does with RTP-based protocols, but there was no uh, grouping of RTP specifications that people could agree on and that would just give the required functionalities for broadcast without bringing uh, much more complexity. Um, in many ways, uh, we kind of concluded that RTP-based stacks were not there for what they needed. Uh, so the next question is, why publish an open source project, right? Why not just create a standard, get around there with other companies, and say, hey, we're, we're just going to write a, a document, and everyone can implement it. Uh, there's multiple reasons for that, and one of this is to have basically something that is usable on day one. Uh, and by having a shared implementation, uh, that's open source, then everyone can cooperate on it. And it also means that you have good interoperability from day one, right? Because it's the same the same code, right? So it, it will interoperate with itself. And also in, encourages people who want to enhance it to actually work together instead of, you know, if you make your own implementation, then there will be a lot of pressure from management to create create value by having some something a bit different from the center, a bit improved that you can go around and say, hey, you can interrupt with anyone else, but if you use our product on both sides, it's gonna be so much better. Uh, in that case, we wanted everyone to really have the highest level of interoperability, to not have like two grades, like open source grade and then the better proprietary grade. That was a, kind of an empty goal here. Um, then it's a project, right? Open sourcing something, creating an open source project is a project in itself, and a project needs a timeline. Our timeline here was quite short at the beginning. So we were aiming to release uh, SRT by uh, the NAB conference in April, which is the big conference in the broadcast industry in the US. Uh, and we started this project in February. So we had only two months, right? It was a, a quite a short timeline. Uh, and then we, we had gave ourselves some time after that, right? We said after the initial launch, uh, if we don't get some tractions within 18 months, then it's not going to work too bad. And the second deadline was after launch, if after three years, we will like have a checkpoint and say, has this been a success or a failure, right? If it has not been a, a success in three years, it's not probably not going to succeed. But one of the other things that was very important is that we said, you know, this might not happen on day one. You have to be able to be in it for the long run. If you want adoption, you have to let people know that you know, you're in it and you're going to maintain it for years, right? That it's not just going to be a thing that you throw over the wall. 
So for an open source project, one of the most important things to make it successful is to have a governance model. Uh, so who are the stakeholders in this governance model? Uh, one of the important ones are uh, the developer, right? As this, this is software, developers are, are really a, a key constituency. But since this is software that's really designed for business use, enterprise use, the management of these developers are also a key constituency. Right? Their bosses are very important too. And then we need to think also who are the users. Uh, since this is really a library, the users are actually other developers, right? They're developers that write applications or products and that will use these uh, library in their product. And these are mostly corporate devo uh, developers, right? These are not hobbyists that are our, 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 key, our key target. Um, so now that we know who the main stakeholders are, we also have to think what other roles are in this, uh, in this project, right? To create a successful project, you need many different things. Yeah, you need people who will write documentation. You will need to help the users uh, actually use it because remember adoption was our goal. So we thought that helping users is a really, really important part. Uh, you need uh, someone to set a direction, both the technical direction and the non-technical, more on the business side of the project. Uh, you need to do marketing, right? So that people actually know about this and will adopt it. And then you need to write code at the end. Uh, next question really is, how much control are you ready to give up? Uh, open sourcing something always means that you're going to give up some control. Uh, it's really, and the amount of control that you give up really is balanced with what, what your other goals are. In this case, the goal was adoption. And uh, so we don't need to seize too much control because we don't actually require other developers to join or something like that. We just want people to use it. So we can really uh, um, not like have a, a model where, where we have like complete external governance. We can keep the governance very much where it was originally. Uh, so we need also a decision-making making process, right? Decision-making process in different projects vary a lot, uh, both for technical and non-technical decisions, right? It could be a board that can be elected or appointed. Uh, you could have like a, a one person deciding, like a dictator, a benevolent dictator, uh, like Linus, or you can have something much more ad hoc, right? This is not a huge project, so uh, maybe if something very structured is too heavy and you might want to have something much more uh, ad hoc, something in between. And since this is really not that big of a project, maybe you don't even need a real structure, right? You, you might really go with something very with the flow. Uh, since it's open source, and one of the things that kind of binds open source communities is the license, uh, we thought that the choice of the right license was very important. Uh, so licenses can go, you know, from permissive licenses, MIT, BSD style, all the way to very strong copyleft licenses like the GPL v3 or AGPL v3, or somewhere in between. Uh, one of our goal here was adoption, and one of the uh, key places where we wanted it to be adopted was in mobile applications. So it was very important that whatever license we choose would uh, not be a problem for uh, App Store users. But we also wanted to kind of discourage uh, proprietary forks to have really interoperability at the highest level. So we tried to find something that was uh, able to satisfy both goals. And for this project, we ended up choosing the MPL because of its different clauses that really make it easy for both sides. So now we, we've taken care of like the, the people aspect and the governance aspect, now we need to take technical steps to actually make it a good open source project. Many projects that operate and originate from proprietary worlds are often developed in the, the idea that there is only like a very small group of people who actually matter and that it doesn't have to follow standards that everyone else can follow. But uh, it's important if you want to open up something that everything is clear and easy for you to spread one. One of the first things that people do when they get an open source project is to try to compile it. And many projects that originate from the corporate world, sometimes you, you're just stuck at that step. Uh, what you really want is a build system that people already know, that is standardized and that is high quality. Uh, there's many different good high quality open source build systems, uh, things like CMake, AutoTools, Mesen, and there's a couple more. But I would not go with something exotic, really. You want, you want something that is uh, 
comment for the language or platform that you're using and uh, that other people will know. In this case, it was already CMake, so we were lucky. Uh, a lot of corporate projects, I said, have like really bad things, sometimes just random make files or maybe very complex make files that rely on a complex infrastructure that tie up with the, the, the company's uh, internal build systems. And that's really, that's bad. And what's even worse is just a bunch of shell scripts. So if, it, if you have that, you have to de delete everything and restart with a, a standard one, right? No one wants to see your internal build systems. Uh, then once you, you have building, then you need a, a place for people to cooperate. Uh, cooperation re requires different tools, right? Uh, issue tracking, you need the source code hosting, uh, you bring something like a wiki or somewhere where you can put text and documentation, build instruction, etc. Uh, all these kind of things. These days, by far the best way to do it is to use one of the GitHub or GitLab, right? Uh, there's, they've really cornered the market. Uh, my personal preference is GitLab because it's open source, but in this case, we went with GitHub because that's what they were already using. Uh, then we need a way for people to talk to each other. Uh, to really support users, I feel that you run both something like a mailing list that is slower and more longer text and a, a chat system uh, like RSC or Slack. Uh, in this case, we have a, a Slack channels where people can go and, and discuss whatever is happening with uh, SRT, get help with um, installing it, using it, developing it, etc. All the developers are there. So it's a really good way to actually uh, communicate. So how did we select like, these tools? Uh, one of the kind of e important things is that they are, these have to be tools that are familiar both to the existing developers so that they're not going to waste too much time with them, and but also to potential contributors and potential users. So the advantage of using very standardized tools is that everyone already knows them and you don't waste time uh, uh, learning them and they don't become a barrier, right? So the goal really is to reduce the barrier to entry and by using tools that are well known and well established, uh, the project doesn't become about the build tools or about the conversion tools, but really about the project itself. The next step is that we need to market it, right? We have a good project, we have a good governance, we have good source code. Now we need to let everyone else know about it. Since this is a library uh, and a media tr transport library, the way that people actually use this is often that they will use it through something else, a bigger library, either something like FFmpeg or GStreamer that will provide uh, the encoding, the decoding, all of the other steps that we need in a media pipeline. Uh, so one of the first things that we did when we decided to make this open source was to figure out which are the important other uh, libraries that they should integrate with and go upstream and send them uh, uh, patches, uh, offering them the integration with LibSRT. Uh, since LibSRT was, had been open source by that point, right, it was uh, much easier for them to accept uh, integration patches. Uh, so we quickly had it integrated in both FFmpeg and GStreamer. And uh, another thing that we ask is, what do people use to test in your industry, right? How do they test if a stream works? You know, what the tool do they use? And they said, well, they're not special, they just use VLC like everyone else. So one of the things that we did very early on was to submit uh, patches to the VLC community to uh, add support for uh, SRT so that you could just type a SRT URL and, and, and uh, VLC and it just works. And uh, the, all of these communities, like VLC, GStream, Fempeg were very helpful and we could get our, our, our patches integrated really quickly. It was, I was surprised how, how easy it was. Uh, so uh, considering it's a completely new protocol. So very quickly we had the uh, uh, SRT support in all three. And a bit later, we also had it integrated in OBS Studio, which is a great way to create content, create a live stream, um, and send it to an SRT receiver. So now that we had it integrated, easy to use, uh, right? sometimes as easy as just putting the URI in, then we had to create awareness. Uh, so there's two parts of creating awareness. One is for open source developers. So part of it was to talk to developers of other relevant projects that we've already talked about and make them aware of SRT, what's its strengths, what's its weaknesses, what it's for, what it's not for, so that they can you know, do marketing for us in a way. And the other important group we wanted to talk to is 
business people, right? Since we're saying that most of the target users here are, are corp corporations, there are peeping people building products, uh, we decided to create a business alliance. So that's an alliance of companies that uh, use SRT, promote SRT, uh, build products around SRT. And uh, this has been like a really important element of the effort. So has it been a success? Well, the answer is yes, right? So uh, I've done the presentation similar to this one a couple of months ago, and I was seeing there were on over 250 members in the Alliance. Uh, today I was told there's over 400. Um, last time I said there were 88 companies shipping products. Now there's uh, 129, if I counted correctly on the website. Uh, and according to GitHub, there's 80, 67 contributors. So even though the goal was really not to gather contributors, we gather contributors anyway because you know if you have something that pe people actually use, they will contribute to it. So that was uh, really, really successful. I, I was really impressed at how quickly, uh, quickly this picked up. When we announced it, within a couple of weeks, companies were lining up to join the alliance. They really brought something to their industry which was lacking. Uh, there was really like a need for this. And immediately we had a lot of updates. So that's been a really, really great success for uh, High Vision and also for open source. So uh, thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask me on Slack of the conference, or you can always re reach me directly. Uh, I'm all over the internet. So you Google my name and you will find me easily. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, have a good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Um, I guess it's time for questions. Just a quick uh, shout out. Uh, if you need any help with bringing anything to the open source world and you don't know where to start, uh, we're, we're happy to help at Collabra. I guess we don't have any questions, but if you want to continue the discussion, you can come on the Slack channel and we're already, already chatting about this. Oh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, have other industry members started to take a bigger role in the governance? Uh, for now, the, the answer is really no. Uh, High Vision are really doing the governance themselves in a way. So uh, it's, it's not something that really they try to get more people on. Um, now another question from Samantha Logan. Uh, can you discuss how we should adapt these things when you're running a service? That's a very good question. I, I guess if, if the service is software, right? Because that's what services are these days. Uh, you basically publish your source code and all of these things are kind of the same. Um, I don't know what else I can say about services. Wait for other questions. I guess we're going to soon run out of time anyway. Uh, is there a quick GStreamer pipeline that you can share to test GStreamer uh, SRT? Yes, there are. Um, so we've made a blog post on the Collabora website on SRT and GStreamer with some examples. But basically, you use SRT Sync. Uh, and then you put the URI. So it works and it's already taken already you feed MPEG transport stream into it. So something like, you know, video source, encoder, uh, MPEG transport source, Muxer, and SRT sync. Or you can use a source, right? SRT source. You can even play a SRT URL just with the play bin if you're familiar with GStreamer. Mark's asking how many panels and similar activities have happened in the public? 
I don't know. I'm not sure where the question is. I guess thank you very much, everyone.